All right. Hi, everybody. It looks like we're all connected now, and we may have a few more prospective students trickling in, but I think we can go ahead and start today's alumni panel for the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. My name is Rachel Skipper. I'm our Assistant Director of Undergraduate Recruitment, and I will be leading slash moderating this session. Um, I'm always here for you if you want to talk admissions, financial aid, your application, all of that stuff. But as you know, today's panel is going to focus on people who have attended the Maxwell School and have since graduated. So I'm going to be introducing our panelists to you in just a moment. Before I do that, I would like you to introduce yourselves to them, right? It's just as important for them to know who they're talking to. So in the chat, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us your first and last name, any majors that you might be considering at the university. I see a, a couple uh, familiar faces here. So I, I know what some of you are, are going to be saying there, but let us know what majors you're thinking about or if you're undecided. Um, and also let us know if there's anything in advance you wanna make sure we bring up, talk about, discuss while we're in the session today. So please use the chat to send that information into us, helps our panelists out, helps me out to know who we're chatting with. While you do that, I will allow our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves to you. Uh, if we could just go on the order of in the screen, starting with Caitlin, that would be helpful. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Menejo Stahl and I graduated from Syracuse in 2019. I majored in international relations and neuroscience and I minored in Italian and political science. And after Syracuse, I went immediately to the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University in New York City where I received a master's of international affairs degree with specialization in urban and social policy. And I'm now a management analyst in office of housing at the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development here in New York City, where I started as an intern during grad school. And then they brought me on full time uh, within the last few months. And I'm happy to be here and answer your questions about Syracuse. Thanks for coming. Hello everyone, my name is Austin Church. Uh, I graduated Syracuse in 2020 and I majored in economics and philosophy with a minor in mathematics. And for that, I went straight through to Boston University School of Law where I'm currently a 2L, so our second year uh, law student. And I will be uh, joining Goodwin uh, Law Firm here in Boston next summer to do work in like tech transactions and working with like emerging companies. And I'm happy to be here. Hi, everybody. My name is Kayla Goldstein. I graduated from Syracuse in 2018. Um, I was a double major in international studies, international relations, and Russian language, literature, and culture um, with a minor in political science. Um, right after graduation, I actually moved to Moscow, Russia, and was living there for the past three years, um, and then hopped back on over to the United States mid-COVID. Um, and I'm now working as a case manager and paralegal at Goldstein and Associates, which is an immigration law firm in uh, Philadelphia. So happy to be here and answer your questions about Syracuse and beyond. Um, thanks for coming. So before we get too far into the depths of life at Syracuse, and we will talk about these panelists' lives at Syracuse, I think it would be useful for you all to hear what these job titles mean. I don't anticipate that everyone knows what a management analyst is, for example, and I think that looks different across people, across organizations. So I'd like each of our panelists to go ahead and tell us just what a standard day in the life doing what you do looks like. So I think we can go maybe in reverse order. Kayla, do you want to begin? And we will move right to left across the slide this time again, just kind of reinforcing for the students what it means to work in your line of work. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so as a head paralegal and office manager at my firm in Philadelphia, um, every morning I wake up, I have a coffee, no real commute to work. I, I actually work in the office um, two or three times a week with COVID. So um, going into the office is just a 20 minute walk. So grab my coffee on the way. Um, I start by looking at my emails, um, maintaining my relationships with all of my clients. I have about 30 um, current cases open, which may sound like a lot, um, and it is, but time management is super important um, organization as well. Um, a lot of those skills are developed through undergrad and graduate school, so it's good that you guys are here. <laughs> um, I'll maintain the, those relationships with my clients, catch up on some emails, and then um, that's when research really kicks in. Um, a lot of the cases that I'm working on now are humanitarian parole um, on the immigration law track, um, I have a lot of clients that are 
individuals of extraordinary abilities. So they have high profile jobs such as doctors working with the CDC to work on maintaining COVID in small regions in the US. Um, maybe a huge tech companies bringing in international staff. Uh, so I work on those business, business cases. Um, then some communication with clients and meetings, Zoom, as we're all familiar with, um, over the phone as well for my non-international um, clients at the time. And then later in the day is drafting briefs, memos to court, um, working with my clients who are abroad and are awake at that time. Um, so it kind of just depends on where they are in the world. Um, and then just a lot of writing. So um, working on those skills that I developed in undergrad and um, beyond kind of just writing a lot. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions after this, but um, that's pretty much my day-to-day. -day. I leave around seven o'clock at night. Um, sometimes it's later work, sometimes it's earlier. Awesome. And uh, like a day in the life for me as a law student, since I'm not yet a lawyer, so I can't speak too much to what I'll be doing once I graduate. Uh, but usually wake up, uh, have classes. I'd say usually in class, like four to five hours a day, depending on the day and a lot of reading, like a lot of reading. I think probably spend another three or four hours each day just doing readings uh, for prayer for classes in research and just for any other things I need to know, which there's always lots to do, uh, a lot of writing. So most of my days outside of class, writing, reading is all I do pretty much. So there's a lot of that. And there's a lot of work. Uh, time management is key since unlike uh, high school and unlike undergrad to another extent, you don't really have any projects to do except for the final. So you there's not, not really many chances for you to figure out if you are on top of the material or if you're understanding uh, with like formal feedback. So it's a lot of time management, really staying on top of things yourself so that you are on top of everything and you can prepare for the last thing without having your hand held because until the exam in the end of the semester, you're pretty much on your own, which is uh, pretty different from like my experience in undergrad and in general too. So to kind of summarize a lot of reading, uh, a lot of writing and I would say usually my day starts about 8, 8.30 and uh, on a normal day, probably finish up 8, 8.30 uh, normally. And I'm happy to answer any further questions you might have. Great, um, so I'm working from home right now, but if I didn't, I'd be commuting to Tribeca and Lower Manhattan super early in the morning. I work from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So I'd probably be on the train at like 6.30 in the morning just to get down there. Um, I report to the production director for the Northeast region uh, and the production division. So that's the production director heads the production division is the part of HUD that actually produces housing. So we're part of the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, if you're familiar with that. Um, so we cover the entire Northeast, Maine to DC. So we're producing uh, affordable and market rate housing across the region by actually financing um, the construction of that housing, refinances, substantial rehabilitations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my primary responsibility is managing the application intake process for the multifamily program for the FHA in the Northeast region. Um, I do a lot of reporting both regionally and then nationally for headquarters down in DC. Um, and more recently, I've been underwriting mortgages for multifamily uh, housing across the Northeast, which is really interesting, really unique learning experience. Normally a management analyst does not do that sort of thing, but as you can imagine, we are very busy right now. So we're all kind of um, helping out where we can, which is wonderful. And then I, I communicate a lot with major banks and lenders. So a lot of times I'm very outward facing um, and represent the government for the Northeast, which is really exciting. And then finally, I just kind of work on special projects for the production division director, who's my direct boss, and then her boss, the regional director for the Northeast, uh, just with, you know, whatever kind of things that, uh, that they need done. Um, and yeah, happy to answer any questions about my job or, you know, getting through USA jobs uh, to apply for federal internships and jobs. 
Awesome. So students, I think you've already probably learned a lot just in the first couple minutes. So that's good. <laughs> um, we will be talking about what all of our panels did at Syracuse to prepare for all the things that they just told you about. And you've, you've had a little preview now. Uh, before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about majors at Syracuse. On the slide are the majors that you will have to choose from in arts and sciences in Maxwell, the two colleges work as a team. So arts and sciences in Maxwell students are often kind of bouncing back and forth between the schools and colleges. Kayla mentioned Russian, right? That's arts and sciences, not Maxwell. A lot of students are doing that kind of thing, blending these different programs together. The orange and underlined programs though are the Maxwell programs. So this is what you'll have to choose from if you enroll with us. And then you can also pick and choose from majors outside the college minors from all over the place. All of our panelists already mentioned they have minors. So I think that's a, a nice representation of the university. It is very common with us. I'd like our panelists to help me out a little bit, just kind of describing how this stuff works, right? We have a lot of students pursuing multiple majors. You see that on the panel. We have a lot of students pursuing minors. We see students crossing the boundaries between different academic areas. Um, so would any of our panelists like to chime in about, you know, here's what I thought I'd do as a college student, here's what I changed, here's what I added on, minors are a good example of that, majors are a good example of that. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, sure, I'll start. Um, so I went into Syracuse knowing that I wanted to major in international relations. Um, I actually picked Syracuse because of the Maxwell program and because of the study abroad program opportunities. Um, I studied abroad my first semester and then I spread, studied abroad twice more. So a little more than like the average student. Um, I just really loved it and I knew what I wanted to do. And then the classes that I took actually helped me decide what I wanted to do um, for my second and third semesters abroad. Um, but so I knew I wanted to do international relations. Political science, which was my minor, actually happened by accident. Um, and many of you are probably like, how do you do, how do you complete a whole minor? by accident, um, which is a great question. Um, a lot of the courses I realized um, kind of coincide with each other and you can, this was the case for me, I'm not sure anybody else, but um, for me, I was doing a lot of core courses for international relations and they ended up counting for the political science minor and I took so many classes that it ended up completing the minor. Um, and so that was really interesting. I didn't actually know until I completed the minor that I had finished the minor, um, but it can be the case that you load up on courses a specific semester or the, the credits transfer over from study abroad and it counts for both your major and a minor or both majors if you double major. Um, so that was kind of interesting in my case. I didn't expect to even have a minor um, or I wanted a minor in art history when I was a freshman. That didn't happen. I took some great art history classes, but um, so it can be kind of surprising. You just have to have like um, a good understanding of what credits you're going to complete um, and advisors definitely help with that and being organized and creating your own schedule and time management as Austin and I talked about. So um, yeah, it can be a little bit surprising what you end up completing, but um, creating your your own academic plan is very doable and and cool. I'll just add a little bit onto that. Um, so I didn't really know what I wanted to major in, but I started as a neuroscience major, which is an integrated learning major. So you have to double major. Um, and then I added, you know, like my primary major, I started as biology and then I moved to communication sciences and disorders and then something else before finally settling on international affairs at the end of my sophomore year, which is like, that's the deadline that you have to, I think, uh, declare a major. Um, and you can change it after that point, but you have to have something declared. Um, and I also spent my first semester of abroad as a discovery student. So if anyone's interested in doing that, check out the discovery program. It's amazing, it's wonderful. Um, and so I used that experience, which I had applied to Syracuse partially for that reason, um, to kind of drive my interest in international affairs. Um, but I was still interested in science, so I decided to keep a neuroscience major um, and then add two minors that would complement the IR major. So I would say, it doesn't really matter if the things that you do aren't related. I was interested in so many things that I figured um, if I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do, I'd just do it all. 
Um, and so I would highly encourage you to not shut any doors before you like try to walk through them first. Um, my advisors for IR and neuroscience were so supportive of the fact that I wanted to do two things that were very different. So I would just add that little, little tidbit. So I think that's really good advice. Uh, keeping your doors open, keeping your horizons broad. Um, the only limit on what kind of topics you can study at Syracuse is you. Um, it depends on what you want to look into, what courses you might want to take. I think our panelists are good examples of that. They, they took on a lot, uh, in addition to maybe being pre-law, for example, in Austin's case. So it's certainly possible if you do one major at Syracuse, you don't do any minors, you don't do a second major with it. You're probably looking at a three-year plan, not a four-year plan. So plenty of room to add in these, these topics. And if you have any questions for our panelists about what their time management would like, look like, you know, how much time they're spending in class, balancing all of this stuff. Um, time management has come up a few times uh, and it's definitely something you have to do. So if you have questions about that, let us know. So we already talked about advising a little bit um, with planning out majors and minors, figuring out what a four-year plan is gonna be. So does, do any of the panelists wanna chime in and, and talk a little bit more about uh, advising and, and how your advisors helped you or other mentors? I know academic advisors are not the only support our students receive. So just mentorship and support in general as you are working all of this out. I can uh, go ahead and chime in. So I ended up with two majors and a minor. Uh, not really super related at all. One was a social science, one was humanities and math, which is its own thing. So going into it, I was, because uh, I started with econ, added philosophy and added math as I went. So I just kind of went through my path, picking up minors and majors as I went along. So since, especially with math, I decided I wanted to pursue some sort of um, minor or major in math about halfway through my junior year. Because uh, I just had taken a bunch of math classes and I wasn't sure what more I needed to take, if it was even possible. So, I, uh, the math, like with some of the math advisors specifically, I sat down with, had never spoke to him before because I didn't have any reason to. And I sat down with him and we kind of hashed out a plan uh, to how we can satisfy all of that. And then I was able to satisfy the minor and then even do uh, some math research and stuff with the pro with the math department on top of the minor just to fully exhaust all of my math interest. So they were very helpful in just finding a way at any point to make, to get a plan instead of just starting off with the plan and sending you on your way. They were with me the entire time I was at Syracuse. I have something to add about advising also. Um, so a lot of the time you will need to take things into your own hands. This, this whole track, like this whole undergraduate experience is what you want it to be. And if you're not getting the assistance that you want, you really should um, try to pursue what you wanna do and make sure that there's someone that fits that vision for you and find them. So like really putting yourself forward and asserting yourself when you wanna do something, a certain program. A lot of the time I did rely on friends that I had made upperclassmen from different, project, different projects I was in, different classes or different programs like um, student-led programs that I was in, having someone who was more of a mentor and not like an official advisor was also very helpful because they had that student experience um, that I was going through at the time. Yeah, I think Kayla's point is absolutely correct. Advisors are there to give you advice, to tell you what they recommend that you do, or if you're not sure what your options are, to tell you what those are. They're not there to tell you what to do. And in fact, they're not going to tell you what to do because you're a college student and these are your decisions, right? They're there as a sounding board and someone to help you if you're kind of lost in what you might need or what you might want. Um, we also do have faculty advisors, right? And I'm sure all of our panelists had faculty members at Syracuse who they relied on, who they would confide in, who gave them advice. That's a big important part of advising. And I'm glad Kayla also mentioned student clubs and organizations. Um, you know, we have students who look to upper level students as mentors or to the staff or faculty or graduate students who lead the organizations that they're in. So you'll get advice kind of from all over the place. I'll mention also that advising academically is merged with career advising in arts and sciences and in Maxwell, where the person you're going to for academic advice can also provide career support. You're gonna get bombarded with emails about internship openings, workshops, resume building opportunities, career fairs, 
uh, networking opportunities, the whole thing throughout your four-year plan. And a lot of times your career advisor can kind of add to that or customize that for you a little bit. So if you're looking for that built-in career advice, the advisors are there for that reason as well. On that topic, I wonder if any of our panelists want to talk about internship opportunities they had. I can start. Um, so I did three internships and I didn't start doing them until my junior year, which is really important to note because I was really panicky and I was like, if I don't have an internship my first year, I'm just going to be, you know, so far behind. That's not true. So if you don't get an internship right away, don't stress. It'll be okay. Um, I interned with the New York Civil Liberties Union in Syracuse, Oxfam Italia in Florence, Italy, and then the Council of Europe Liaison Office to European Union in uh, Brussels, Belgium. And so for Oxfam and the Council of Europe, I applied with the help of SU Abroad. Um, so they also have, you know, their own advisors, um, academic advisors, career advisors, both here in the States and then overseas at all the different um, campuses and like program offices. So I did those internships actually overseas um, during either semester or summer abroad. Um, and then for the New York Civil Liberties Union, one of my best friends at Syracuse was already interning with them. So he knew I was interested in human and civil rights. So he was able to bring me on board. Um, and with all of those internships, they're not related to what I do now in terms of like skills. Um, but they did teach me a lot about like how to interact professionally, um, how to interact across cultures, a lot about law, um, human and civil rights. And, uh, I think that that did end up helping me and steered me a little bit more towards what I do now. Um, because, you know, my job is essentially protecting human and, and civil rights in the housing field. Uh, so I would say even if your internships don't relate directly to what you end up doing, it's okay because you can still make a connection. It's still a wonderful learning experience. Yeah, um, I had a few internships as well um, throughout the semester and over the summers. I see from this list here, uh, I worked at uh, the VA Healthcare Center. Um, which was really, really interesting. I actually got involved with them through um, the community service fraternity I was a part of, Alpha Phi Omega on campus. Um, so they directed me towards um, an internship opportunity, which was great. I also volunteered a lot at Upstate and had an opportunity to work at RISE, which was the Refugee and Immigrant Self-Empowerment Center. That was amazing. Also kind of really influenced the work that I do now. I'm working at an immigration law firm. It was just great, similar to what Caitlin was talking about, um, learning about civil rights, human rights. Definitely a very influential um, experience. And they led me to my work study at the study abroad office and working at the Slutsker Center for International Students, where I tutored and worked with a bunch of ESL graduate students to kind of bolster their language, work on presentations with them so that they can present in their classes. So there are a lot of internship opportunities that are open on campus that you find out through word of mouth with other students. Um, a lot of opportunities that come through from professors as well. They send out like internship opportunity emails for the summer and during the semester. If you have some time, you're not maxed out on credits and want to pursue something like that. Very helpful, like just within the community. So if you talk with a professor, like when you start classes, make sure you're on a listserv for that kind of thing. It definitely puts you in a good position to try and pursue something over the summer or during the semester. I also posted a link in a chat to Handshake, which is a relatively new platform that Syracuse has in place. It's sort of like Indeed meets LinkedIn. So they have job postings where employers who are looking for Syracuse University grads to go work there or Syracuse students to intern there. Uh, they'll post those opportunities there and then you can filter all those opportunities based on what's in your profile. Okay, next up is research. Um, so I don't actually know anything about our panelists' research background, um, but if anyone did research as an undergrad and, and wants to chime in on that, that would be great. Yeah, I can think I can go ahead and start. So I did research in both economics and in math. So with the math research I did was I was there was a, like a program at Syracuse that kind of pairs undergrads up with current grad students in math to learn a specific topic and if in some cases, if it, if it allows, do actual research with those uh, grad students. So that semester I did that, I 
was studying complex analysis, which don't want to bore you with the details of that, but I was helped him with research. And one of the things that we worked on was included in his dissertation. So it does have like the stuff you can do does have impact. And for the econ side, uh, there's an opportunity to write like a formal thesis in economics. And I was a part of that. And I spent an entire year doing research in economic analysis, like you see, like PhD candidates and PhD uh, in economics do. And I uh, spent the year researching the effect of risk tolerance on the decision to make what you major on major in in college. So I was trying to uh, use like risk tolerance to predict the choices all of you will be making once you come to Syracuse. That's really cool. And, you know, kind of like what Austin said, I mean, it's something you pick up an interest in that you learn, oh, I could find an answer to this question, right? That's what research is. You find a question that's interesting to you as a college student, might be directly related to your major, might not be, but you're gonna work with a graduate student, a faculty member, or a campus organization, right? I've mentored students who are interested in education policy, right? And intern with me in admissions in the past. So you just find someone who knows stuff about that on campus, and then you can find your own answers to those questions. And it's not a question that was assigned to you. It's not something you were forced to do. Right, it's learning more about something you're interested in. Um, I do have some examples of current students on this slide. And I did mention in the chat, Max on the slide is a current uh, Maxwell student. The other students are arts and sciences. But if you're interested in talking with Max too, um, he's always he's abroad right now, but he is responsive via email, and I could connect you with him. Just email me if you'd like to do that. Does anyone else want to chime in with any research experience or advice before we move on? Kayla, yeah, um, really quickly, I did um, the majority of my research, actually all of my research, when I was abroad. So all of my junior year, I studied abroad in um, St. Petersburg, Russia, and I actually had a research advisor that I had pre-planned on um, working with before I went abroad. Um, and then that whole year I spent um, doing research for my capstone project, which was basically my senior thesis which I used for uh, my Maxwell requirement and um, ended up using a lot of that research for my Russian major as well and my honors program. It was very extensive. It took a whole year to do um, and I didn't have that support like that on campus support since I was abroad, um, but it was, it was very doable. Um, it was a lot of statistical research on mass communication and miscommunication in Russia and how it formed public opinion um, especially like around the election time, 2016, wow, that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I worked like all within my own resources. You can get funding for specific research programs, even as an undergrad, but um, mine didn't really require anything like that. It was more like word of mouth and speaking with um, interna not international students, but Russian students um, as a foreigner. Um, so that was a great experience because I had to really take everything into my own hands and pursue that project on my own and then get credit for it once I got back to Syracuse. And with the proper support was very successful and I ended up getting that research published after I graduated. Awesome. Um, I will point out the office on campus called The Source because Kayla mentioned publication. And that's something that a lot of our students want to do, right? Of course, you want a permanent stamp that shows that you did this work, that you can then put on your resume, that you can hold as your own unique individual research. Students do that at Syracuse, they do it in Maxwell, they do it in Arts and Sciences. If publishing your work is something you'd like to do, um, and it should be, it should be a goal of yours if you're doing any kind of research as an undergraduate student, you can go to the source for funding that will help push you there awards that you can win based on having published research, for example, uh, money that would pay for your research hours, right? So I know students, for example, who treat research like a student job, they get paid hourly for the research they do. So that's something that would be an option for you as well. And I just want to point out what on-campus options there are for support while you're doing all this work. Okay, so we've been on the career path for a little bit here talking about, you know, what do we do to prepare for careers? What do those experiences look like? Um, I did pre-war in Austin. I was going to pick on him to talk about pre-law advising because I know not all of you are thinking about going right into a job. Some of you are thinking about, you know, how does this stuff prepare me to go to law school, not necessarily to go right into the workforce. So Austin, do you want to talk about your experiences with, with pre-law advising? Uh, I know our, our pre-law advisors loved Austin. They still are like, oh, Austin, that's cool. He's doing that. Like they, they are big Austin fans. So I know that he had a pretty strong relationship with our advisors there. 
Um, and then Austin, I can chime in with any broader details um, after you give your personal experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I had a, a great experience with the pre-law advisors. So uh, just for those of you who are considering law school, uh, what you major in doesn't matter. If you have like a degree, you can go to law school. You don't need to like have select classes planned out in a certain order like you do need for med school. Uh, so you have that freedom to take what interests you and then go to law school if you if that's what you want to go down. So once I was around the start of my junior year, I started to get in contact with them to start getting a plan together for getting the LSAT and getting all, all the materials ready to apply. And I kept in touch throughout the acceptance uh, cycle after I applied. And they were always there to support me. Like I remember uh, the fall of my senior year when I was sending out applications, I had a question uh, with for one of the law schools I was applying to that I didn't want, to, I wanted to know the answer, but I wasn't sure if I should have it identify me when I asked the question. And so the pre-law advisor I was talking with, I explained that to her and she like star 67 called the law school to like hide the area code. So they wouldn't know it was from a student talking about someone from Syracuse to ask this question for me so they can get this answer without uh, letting my identity, identity be known to them. So they went always went above and beyond to do what was best for me. So they were there for advice, but they were never, they were never trying to push me in one direction or the other. They were just uh, laying out options and being very helpful, but not just uh, the advice of, oh, here are the deadlines, but for the more personal side of what is the best fit for you, and then going above and beyond to help in ways you wouldn't really expect an advisor necessarily to be helping, which was awesome. So for those of you who are interested in hearing more about pre-law advising, um, Austin, I don't know if you're working with Laura or Rachel at the time, um, but Rachel is leading pre-law YouTube videos, right? So sessions that she's doing for prospective students like yourselves that they're recording and posting on YouTube. So I'm putting the link to that uh, in the chat. Uh, there are only just the two pre-law advisors at Syracuse. So Austin's experience would pretty much be your experience. Uh, it's a small team. They work with all of our pre-law students. Um, and you can kind of see and hear from them a little bit more by checking out the YouTube video that I just posted. I believe that one was for admitted students, but you know, information is the same either way. Okay, so at this point, I want to hear what questions you have for our panel. Um, I have questions I can ask them, right, to kind of keep the conversation moving. I would rather know what questions you all in the audience have, because this is your time and it's your big college decision. Uh, so what questions do you have for our panel members? Just let us know in the chat or raise your hand and I will pass the mic to you. Go ahead, Leo. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I was curious, what's your guys' biggest piece of advice for balancing, like, you know, your friends in college, those other experiences, and while, like, uh, succeeding academically? I can, if it's okay with everyone, I'll go ahead and start. So I think the biggest piece of advice would be to set up some schedule or some way for you to know what schoolwork needs to be done, so you know like what deadlines are coming up so you can mod so you can have that in mind when you make plans for friends or activities or clubs and or all these other things that you have op the opportunity to do but to know at any given point what ne needs to be done on the school front so you're not ever getting caught off guard or surprised by something so if you have like a bunch of assignments coming up you would know that ahead of time so you can plan accordingly so just to have some things that you aren't ever surprised by something. So you can, you know, really schedule your way around it would be my advice. I'll also add that social hour in Bird Library is 100% a thing that Syracuse students do. Like I used to sit at the tables at Pages Cafe and Bird Library and do homework for hours, but all of my friends would be there. And like half the time we were chit-chatting and then the other half the time we're like, okay, we need to do work. And that's kind of, I think like, I see Kayla nodding, like that's kind of a universal experience for a lot of Syracuse students. And it's really fun actually, even though you're like doing work, so. Absolutely. Um, I'll also just add in the chat, our current students talk about this stuff a lot too. I mean, our, our alumni panelists have been saying, you know, I was took, taking on all this stuff. I had to manage my time. I learned to do that as a college student. Here's what I did. That has not changed. Our current students are very much in the middle of that process that our alumni have largely mastered now at this point, right? So they're posting about that on Instagram. 
Um, a few weeks ago, they were taking screenshots of the Excel sheets that they use to keep track of their schedule, you know, telling you about what apps they use to manage their time, um, tips for, you know, things that they have found helpful. So if you want to check that out on Instagram, I put the link to the account where our current students are posting. Um, I think Alyssa was up next and then we'll go to Maya. Hi, so I was wondering in terms of dual enrollment majors, how did those opportunities sort of um, fuse or connect and how were they separate, especially in terms of opportunities advising, stuff like that? Because I'm looking to double major or do a dual enrollment with a major in Maxwell and a major in Newhouse. I don't think any of our current alumni panels were dual majors between schools on campus, um, but does anyone want to talk about double majoring and then I can fill in the blanks about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so. As I mentioned, I was a double major in international relations and Russian language literature and culture. So that's between um, Maxwell and the arts and sciences schools. Um, so for that, I decided on my major of international relations when I applied to Syracuse as an undergrad student, and then Russian kind of manifested itself from my interests, um, going to the classes for international relations, like those core classes. And also in high school, I had heard Russian. I thought it was really cool. I was actually studying Italian because I studied abroad in uh, Florence, Italy for my first semester in a discovery program like Caitlin mentioned earlier. Um, but I didn't want to pursue Italian. I wanted to pursue Russian. Um, so I just, I did a, an abroad program over the summer. And then when I got back, I pursued um, the Russian major. Um, so it really just depends. And like the advising, you also have an advisor for each major that you do. So I had a Russian language advisor and I had a international relations major advisor. I also had a study abroad advisor. So there's a lot of advising going on. Um, but that's a great question. I really encourage you to reach out to admissions and find a current student who's doing um, the dual program through Rachel. Um, and she can hook you up with a student who can really answer those like base questions about how you juggle those two programs, especially Newhouse is very an intensive program, as I'm sure you know. Um, and so that will be a really interesting thing to get some more information on. But I hope I was able to answer a little bit about that. I'll also just quickly add my roommate um, was Newhouse and Maxwell. And so she did the PR program in Newhouse and then IR in Maxwell. And so her end goal was public diplomacy, which is what she does now. Um, and I will say that the advisors in both schools were really supportive of like, if she wanted to keep the two separate, she could, but if she wanted to integrate them in one way or another, they were really supportive of like research opportunities for her, um, figuring out how to like integrate PR into her IR thesis and then, you know, back and forth. So it's definitely possible and it, it's what you make of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that advice is absolutely relevant. And I will just add on some extra information that applies when your majors are not within arts and sciences in Maxwell and you're instead going outside of us, right, to Newhouse, to the Whitman School. I think Maya's interest is in business finance, right? So she's probably another student who's thinking, you know, how can I branch outside of arts and sciences in Maxwell? Students absolutely do it. They apply a lot of times on the Common App to both simultaneously, which you can do. So that's something to think about if you're confident this is what you want to do. Doing that program combination between us and someone else on campus means that you're on a little stricter of a timeline because they have requirements for you and we have requirements for you and you need to satisfy both. Whereas if you stay within Arts and Sciences and Maxwell, the basic requirements are the same. You're just tagging on a few extra things for your majors. So we try to work together that we have kind of agreements between Newhouse and Arts and Sciences. We have agreements between Arts and Sciences and Whitman, for example, to kind of help that overlap be a little bit more planned, a little less bumpy for you. Um, but it is extra work. It's a significant amount of extra work, but it's still a four year plan. You don't need to do summer classes. Tuition does not increase. Um, so it's, it's an option, but we can talk about it more or I can, um, like Kayla mentioned, connect you with a current student that's doing that. I think I know of two um, arts and sciences slash Maxwell in Newhouse schools right now. Okay, let's take Maya's question. All right, so I have a couple of questions for Caitlin and Austin mostly. So I'll just start like with the easier one. And this one's for Austin. I know that you were an econ major and I take econ now as a senior. But I, for 
my minor, I was thinking of either finance or business analytic. And, uh, and I cannot speak, sorry. <laughs> but um, for like business marketing, that kind of side, would you say econ as like a major covers both of like the marketing, the business, whereas still covering stocks and the stock market and stuff like that? Yeah, so econ, the major covers a lot. It's um, a very broad major. So you can take there's very few required classes. So you don't have to, it's not like a strict, you take these 10 classes for the major. You have, once you get through like the inter, intro and intermediate courses, it's whatever econ classes you find interesting, they can count. Mm -hmm. So you can take those classes that are lean more into the business in the finance analytics side. Um, I would say not a full overlap. There would still be uh, benefits to taking those classes in with like Whitman from that more finance perspective. But one thing I will say is additional with the econ program at, Syrac at Syracuse, there is like the like a BA and a BS program with the BS, which is what I did, a lot more math intensive with a lot of that like statistical analysis type uh, courses and coursework that in that kind of stuff is also stuff you will see in finance if you're actually doing like analyzing stocks and doing projections and things like that. So you mm -hmm. So econ is pretty broad and you can chart your way through it however you think it was best for you. All right, cool. Thank you. And then Caitlin, I saw that you are a neuroscience major, which is one of the double majors that I am like more interested of like kind of my main career wise, at least for now. And I also saw that you did international relations and now you're doing US Department of Housing. So that's kind of like further from the psychology aspect of neuroscience. I was just wondering how like you apply your neuroscience major to that and like how you switched. Cause I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong that you started in neuroscience and then added. Okay, yeah. So like how you kind of just added that on how you like integrated that. Cause I do love psychology, but you know I'm unsure of my future and like jobs and but I, just want to see how you applied it to something different. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so one thing I'll say before I start is that the neuroscience major is only, I think, 24 credits. So mm -hmm. the commitment's a little bit smaller than if you were to do like a full psychology major, which is one thing that's really nice if you're like kind of in between and you don't really know which direction you want to go or if you're going to like use it for your career or like grad school or something. So I think that that's one thing that's really nice about the neuroscience ILM. Um, but yeah, I did start as a neuroscience major. I thought that medicine was my calling, psychology was my calling. Um, and then I went abroad my first semester and I was like, wow, international affairs, that sounds cool. Um, so originally, um, like I said, I was still sticking with the STEM stuff. Um, and then like halfway through college, I was like, well, why not do both? I like both of them. I could figure out some way to connect them. Um, and the IR department at first was like, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do with both of these majors? It doesn't really make sense. And so I had to, you know, go back and forth. Um, and the neuroscience department in particular really helped me to like refine my ideas about how I'm gonna integrate the neuroscience knowledge into IR, since IR was like the primary focus that I had. Um, so the, the idea that I proposed to both departments is one day I'd like to work for the World Health Organization um, and do like policy related to like children's literacy or like, I don't know, lead-based pain poisoning or something like that. Um, and I kind of stuck with that idea and ended up writing, I had to do a, like a thesis paper for neuroscience and it was a policy paper. Um, and that was, you know, I was advised by my professors in the neuroscience department to take that route. Um, and so it ended up being like less science and research and more like something to inform policy. Um, and so then, like I said, I, I went to grad school, I got a policy degree, um, 
but it was in urban and social policy. And so a lot of what urban and social policy is, is like related to health policy. So like Medicare, Medicaid, um, housing policy, which has a lot to do with health. So right now, like what allowed what I do is focusing on like radon poisoning, lead-based paint poisoning, um, especially just containing materials and like to have a science background isn't required to do that type of work, but to know exactly why like radon's bad, lead-based paint is bad, especially for children, um, why asbestos containing materials are bad and like to know the, the neurological and like just generally physical impacts of those types of things, I think has been really beneficial to me. Um, I'm not doing anything related to science right now, obviously, but maybe one day. So I would say like, even if you're really interested and you're not sure which direction you wanna go, still do it, still try it out um, because it could, you know, inform the things you do in the future in, in a way that you wouldn't expect. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate gathering like different people's perspectives and opinions and like their stories. So thank you so much. Awesome. So up next, um, I want to respond to Devin's question in the chat about the student faculty relationship and then Leo will be coming to you next. Um, I know that Kayla already talked about the student faculty relationship uh, a little bit in the chats, I think if I'm remembering, yes. So do either of our other two panelists want to chime in on what their relationships were like with our faculty members, how you cultiv cultivated those relationships? Yeah, I can uh, chime in a little bit. So I took classes in like a variety of you know subjects and I'd say especially really after my uh, freshman year, I didn't really take very many classes with more than 30 or 40 people. Uh, and most of them were much smaller than that. So you had a lot of ability to interact with your professors, speak in class, speak to them after class, office hours, about things that you talked about or just in class or just general questions you might have about like the, the, the subject of the course in general, even if it's not specifically covered. And just to develop those relationships that way, research opportunities, uh, the people I did research with, I still I still speak to some of them today, and I graduated a little over a year ago. So these connections are, you know, they're not too hard to make. Uh, professors, I've never, no professor ever said, I will not speak with you. They were all happy to speak. They're all passionate about what they do, and will lo love to chat about anything and everything you could think of. So it's really just you know, reaching out and uh, coming with questions and going from there. Yeah, if anything, I think our faculty want more connection with students than they get. Like they open their office hours, they sit there waiting for people to come in and one person might show up the whole hour and then they'll give their class a hard time. Like no one came to office hours last week. So I think our faculty would like as much interaction with our students as they can get. We have Leo with a question. Leo, go ahead. Um, this question is like kind of for like the panel as a whole, but as people who've gone through Syracuse and you know have done their thing and going on to do their things in their um, given fields, uh, I just was curious to ask, like, what was your biggest like? I don't want to say takeaway, but like, what was your biggest thing that Syracuse imprinted on you as a student, as someone who's about to who's in or someone's about to go into the workforce, like? What did Syracuse mark on you that you think is specific to Syracuse? I can go ahead and ju uh, jump in again. And I'd say uh, for me, some of the biggest things that Syracuse imparted on me was one, um, early and fast exposure to professors in a lot of very different perspectives. Like I took many different classes, many different subjects from the get-go in things I was already interested in. So I was able to learn many different perspectives about how the, how the world works and how all different uh, aspects of the course coursework uh, areas of study all mixed together uh, in the world. So it's, nothing is wholly isolated. And then also Syracuse is a very collaborative environment. So from the get-go, really working with a bunch of other people from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and getting that collaboration and learning how to work with people as a world citizen was uh, very special. I definitely want to piggy off, piggyback off of what Austin said and reiterate that. Um, so I chose Syracuse specifically because of Maxwell's reputation and the study abroad programs that I wanted to do. It was a great environment to be able to foster those, um, those relationships that I made with different friends, um, the clubs 
the opportunities, just the size of the school in general. It's a huge school. I think when I went, it was um, my first year was 2014, 2015, and we had about 25,000 or so undergrad students. That's insane. I mean, I would walk around campus and I would still recognize people on the quad, which I think is crazy because with 25,000 students, plus the graduate students and the law students, um, it's just wild to have that many people in such an enclosed space, but it didn't really feel like that. Um, so the size of the school, I, I visited a ton of schools. I don't know how many schools that you guys have on your list to apply to, but I applied to over 10 and I'm not going to say how many, but I had a lot on my list and I didn't know what exactly what I was looking for <clears throat> until I found the Maxwell program and how it aligned with <clears throat> What did I what I wanted to do and what international experiences I wanted um, and then having those ties of a home campus was really important to me so I think exactly what Austin said like that collaborative environment was great um, it really helped because I didn't just have students who thought exactly like me but it heads with a few with a few professors as well um, but it was just a great experience to really have that environment where we could talk about things and be adults about things and not have to kind of tip a toe around each other's ideas um and then also kind of tying in isabella's question in the chat um what's one of the most rewarding parts of it i don't think anyone's mentioned mentioned yet the like vast alumni network that syracuse has but um it's great for building career relationships later down the road it's great for getting internships it's great for finding different job opportunities and i will say i was at the airport in like poland and some guy was wearing a syracuse sweatshirt and i was wearing a syracuse hat and we were both on layovers and we just ran into each other and i had no idea who he was and we weren't in the same year at all but we were both syracuse alum and it was really cool to just see someone in a random part of the world that we had like such an uh interconnectedness um together so that was really awesome um, but yeah, just the the environment, everybody who goes there is very forthcoming and very direct and super collaborative. So that was um, that was something that, I, that I'll take with me and something that I'm really happy to be a part of. I'll also just quickly jump in and say one of the biggest lessons that I took away from my time at Syracuse is if you want something and you're interested in something, chase after it at full speed because someone's going to be there to be like oh hi welcome yeah we've been waiting for you to come do this um there are just so many different things that i got to do during my time at syracuse that fully set me up to be successful in grad school and then at my job um whether it's like you know like they've mentioned learning to be collaborative or just like the different skills and knowledge that i possess or, you know, even something as simple as like non academic stuff like the friends that I made while I was at Syracuse, they continue to be a support system, not only for my career, but uh, personally. So I would just add that. Thank you for our panelists. Um, that was going to be our last question. We have one minute left. Um, I see that Jason had asked a question that we didn't get to about political science differences between IR and poli sci. Jason, you can email our panelists to ask that question. I can also talk to you about it, but I think you answered your own question. You're on the right track <laughs> with the question that you left. Yes, political science is gonna give you more political theory, political structure, whereas international relations is gonna focus more on diplomacy, cross-cultural communication, geography, those kinds of topics. Do both. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. Students have certainly double majored in political science and IR. There's no reason that you need to choose between the two. Um, another question in the chat that would be a 45 minute discussion and we don't have time to talk about today is diversity, equity, inclusion at Syracuse, specifically in Maxwell. Um, how do current topics in DEIA kind of cross into our classroom setting? The brief answer is they do all the time. You can't avoid being in a school like the Maxwell School talking about public policy, social justice, ethics on a daily basis and not get into these topics. Um, that's a stamp of the Maxwell School that they focus on social justice in their classrooms and in their research. So that's something that, you know, our classrooms and those topics are inseparable. If you want more details about that, again, email the panel, email me. I can put you in touch with a student. I can give you more specific examples. Um, lastly, I just want to make sure, again, that you all have access to our current students who are on Instagram. You can scan the QR code on the screen to follow current students. 
You can also contact me and I can put you in touch with someone who matches your majors, interests, hometown, you know, whatever you're looking for. Um, I do encourage you to use those resources. And then before we wrap up today's session, I just need to give a big thank you to our panelists who you've heard how busy their lives are. Poor Austin's gonna go back to reading, right? The others will be <laughs> starting early mornings tomorrow. Um, so we really all appreciate you being here, especially now. I think the students understand a little bit about your jobs, your days, your schedules, and they know how valuable your time is. So thank you so much for being here, for sharing your experiences, sharing your stories and giving really fantastic advice uh, to our student audience. And then student audience, I don't wanna leave you out either. You're busy, you're stressed, we know it's bad. Uh, we get the kind of pressure you're under. We understand the difficulty of the decisions you're making right now and spending an hour of time with us. And some of you, you know who you are, multiple hours that I know you and I have sat here. Uh, it doesn't go unnoticed. We do appreciate your time. And please reach out to me, it's a two-way street, right? What more do you need? How can I help you? Um, how do I help you make good use of your time as you're learning about Syracuse and other schools? So. When it comes up, we will chat. Thank you again all for being here and we will see you next time.